Okay, uh, Julie Rawls from the Port of Vancouver is going to give us a presentation on what's happening, what, what all of the newest updates, and this is going to be recorded um, until the questions and answers are through, and then we will stop recording. But as of now, everyone on here is being recorded. Okay, Marilee, I'll go in and see if I can share my screen. And you guys let me know when you can see that. It's coming up, okay. Yep. And I'm gonna click down here and see if I can get it in kind of slideshow mode. Here we go. Okay. Very good. All right, so let's get going. And um, this is gonna be kind of an, my abbreviated port tour uh, presentation that I give with a few extra slides I threw in for you guys uh, that you kind of asked about. So let's get going. Uh, just a little bit of information about um, the port. Let's see if I can, I'm going to try to move my, um, you guys are kind of showing right here. Sorry. Uh, what view can I get? Show grid video. Whoop, no, that's not what I want. Oh, well, I think I know this well enough. Uh, just a little bit of information about the port that uh, we, Washington has a ton of ports. We're the, we're the most trade dependent state in the country. So we have 75 port districts in the state of Washington. The port of Vancouver is the third oldest port behind Seattle and Grays Harbor. And uh, we were formed in 1912. And we're one of 11 deep water ports in the state. And I think we have seven deep water ports along the Columbia River system. And a lot of people don't realize we have three ports in Clark County. It's not just us. We also have the port of Ridgefield and the port of Camas Washougal. And to be a port, you really just have to be involved in a couple of things. You have to be involved in economic development in the form of job creation or training, or you need to be uh, you need to be involved in tourism as an economic stimulus. And, and so we have lots of ports that aren't on water in the state of Washington. We have landlocked ports that are just involved in job creation or tourism. The port of Walla Walla is an interesting one because they, um, they primarily serve as a business incubator for the wine industry because, you know, wines in that uh, area of the Washington state are just wonderful. And uh, the Port of Walla Walla builds a lot of incubator space to try to nur uh, nurture that wine industry. And there's a funny saying in, in the port world that if you've seen one port, you've seen one port. They're all very different and do many different things. And so a uh, little bit about the ports around here. Uh, I usually bring this slide up to show people where we're located because a lot of people that come even on the port tours don't know where the port is and it, it's not it's not that unusual because most of the port which is down here i'm kind of circling is all within what we call a twic area controlled by the department of homeland security and the coast guard so people can't get in to see the port and that's a real challenge for us it's hard for us to show people what we do but we start down here at terminal one right next to the interstate bridge the port has 10 acres down here that we're developing. Can you guys see that on your screens okay, where my little cursor is? Okay. Yeah. And a lot of people think the port is developing the entire riverfront, but we're not. We're developing just 10 acres around here, kind of centered around the old Key and Red Lion. The rest mm -hmm. of the property was originally Boise Cascade. Boise Cascade then put their property up for sale, they left. The city was smart enough to buy that 33 acres of waterfront property, very, uh, very good decision, which they in turn then sold to a developer, a company called Graymore. And Graymore has been actively developing all those acres. The city was in charge of putting in the seven acre park and uh, the, you can just see it kind of a little bit right here where my cursor is, but the, um, the pier. Uh, designed by Larry Kirkland. There's, a, there's a, a Grant Street Pier now that comes out over the water. So the city built the park and the pier and, and laid down uh, the roads and infrastructure there that made it ready for development. So of course there's a lot going on at the waterfront. The port picks up again down here near our grain elevators in Terminal 2. This is uh, where we move a ton of grain out to go feed the world. And 
We have lots of ships that come in here at Terminal 2. This is primarily where our steel ships come in, where the wind blades come in here at Terminal 2. Terminal 3 uh, is used for a, just a variety of things, but this is primarily where our mineral bulk facility is. So we move out bentonite clay and copper concentrate, which is unloaded or loaded onto ships. And then down here at Terminal 4 is our Subaru yard. So this is where the auto ships come in and discharge all those Subarus and they're parked in here in what's called the first place of rest. And this little bitty building right here is where the Subarus are all uh, detailed. It's, it's where, all, however you've ordered your car, it comes in here, there are about two, 150 people who work here and they put in the car spoilers, car, um, any special rugs you've ordered, radios. Uh, uh, they do all the detailing of all the cars uh, so that the cars come over very light. They add all that, that stuff later. And then over here is our loop track at Terminal 5. When we get in those wind blades, they, we've been trucking them over here and they wait at Terminal 5 and are laid down here until they go out by truck or train. The loop track is really important for the efficient moving of trains. So when we have trains come in here and they come along here and they go, whoops, rats, let me go back, I'm sorry. Uh, when they go through the port and unload here at our grain facility, they are shuffled on down the system until they come all the way out here to Terminal 5, where they can turn around and then head out again. So it's a, just a very efficient way to move trains in and out. What's not shown here is to the left what we call our gateway property, which is this 600 acres for future development. We own quite a bit of property out sort of near Vancouver Lake. Um, that uh, is for future future development. And then over here, this slide talks about uh, the mitigate a little, you get a little view of the wetland mitigation bank over here, which is an area that's set aside in perpetuity for wildlife. And that will never be developed. The mitigation bank is um, a really important area out uh, in the lowlands out here. A little bit about our commissioners. If you don't know them, we have three commissioners. Most all the ports in the state of Washington, I think only two have five member boards. Most ports have three commissioners. Of course, Eric LeBrant was just reelected. He'll be uh, commissioner again for another six years. Don Orange is up for reelection, I think, in two years. And Jack Berkman is one of our newer commissioners. And the commissioners are in charge of setting policy and approving leases at the port. They have one employee and that's our executive director, Juliana Marler. She's the first female CEO we've had in the history of the port, yay, yay. And uh, all the rest of us report to Juliana. We have about 120 employees at the port, including our security and our maintenance staff and all. We all report to Juliana and she alone reports to the board. Little bit about the Columbia River Channel. The channel itself uh, is dredged, not, not the entire river, just the river channel, which is about 600 feet wide. That channel is dredged to 43 feet, which allows us to get these big ships in. And they come in at Astoria and they come all the way down to the port of Vancouver, about 103 nautical miles. We are the furthest inland deep water port. This is as far up as the big ships go, is the Port of Vancouver and the Port of Portland. And that is why when you go past and the interstate bridge, the channel is maintained at 14 feet all the way to Lewiston, Idaho, which is why you'll only see barges in that section of the river because it's not dredged deep enough for big ships. So the big ships just come in as far as uh, Vancouver and Portland and then uh, go back out again. A little bit about the, the amount of uh, international trade done on the river, uh, the cargo value, and just how many jobs depend on that working river channel. Just a little bit, uh, I, I spend a lot of time talking about the Columbia River bar pilots when I do the tours, but they're really amazing specialized people. We have about 17 Columbia River bar pilots and they are responsible for bringing every ship through the very difficult Columbia bar. Uh, it has been called the, the uh, um, well, uh, 
the it's been called the graveyard of the Pacific because it's just one of the most dangerous waterways on Earth. So in um, good weather, the the bar the bar pilots go out by this kind of ship and they go out about fifty miles out to sea and they get on board the ship. They go up these little ladders like this. They actually jump from these uh, fast moving boats onto this little ladder and go up to the ship. In bad weather, they rappel down. Uh, they are taken out by helicopter and rappel down. And they also rappel back up at the end of their shifts if the weather's bad. If the weather is really, really, really bad, they do not go. Uh, the Coast Guard makes that call. And uh, it's unusual when they close the bar, but they do every now and then. Uh, because the Coast Guard is not, does not care what's on your ship. They only care about loss of life. And so they want to make sure no one is, is uh, in danger going through the Columbia Bar. This is just a little graphic that shows some of the shipwrecks at the mouth of the Columbia River. And I just got this updated last week for this presentation, just how many bar closures we had in 2021. Uh, we had seven. And those are significant because when they close the bar, that means there is no commerce happening on the river and time is money. So anytime your ship is stuck out here waiting in the ocean or, wait, or maybe you're tied up in Astoria, uh, they, want, they want to get on their way. And uh, so bar closures are, are uh, watched pretty carefully. And this is just another graphic that kind of depicts that, uh, that area where the river is running out and the ocean is coming in is what makes the Columbia Bar just so very difficult to navigate. But this kind of shows you that river plume coming out and meeting the ocean and why that's such a difficult area to, to navigate. And when the ships come in, after the, the, uh, the bar pilots bring them through, they, they bring the ship about 15 miles up river, and then they get off, and a river pilot gets on board. And we have about 45 river pilots, and they bring the ships all the way from Astoria to Lewiston, Clarkston area. And they make sure your ship is uh, navigates through the... Um, uh, the shipping channel, which changes all the time. These uh, guys are very, they work very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers to, to know exactly where, the, uh, where to safely take those ships so that they can get to their port. And of course, I put this slide in because it's not always a nice sunny day when you're navigating on the river. Uh, you might have fog like this. So these guys have to really watch their instrumentation and know what they're doing to get those ships to port. Just a little bit about the port's budget and this slide, Merrily, I had to update this slide from what I sent you last week, the folks who may have gotten this ahead of time. Uh, I did not have the correct uh, number here for our 2022 budget. So this is a correct number. It's what we're, we're budgeted for, for next year. And a little bit, we only have 2020 cargo numbers right now because our year isn't over. And so we won't have 2021 cargo numbers till probably January when we get all done uh, compiling all of that. So all I can give you right now are 2020 cargo numbers, but you at least get to see uh, how much cargo we moved in 2020, how many ships came and called on the port of Vancouver, how many rail cars came through. Our revenue is generated mostly 53% by our marine activities. So what happens on the river is very important to us. We also get 20% of our revenue through our tenant leases, through taxes, and through other grants that uh, we apply for. I get questions about the port tax levy. If you live in the port district, some of you might, some of you may be outside the port district in NAC, just not sure. But for those who do live in the port district, you'll see the port on your tax bill. The port tax levy is 12.6 million or 24 cents per $1,000 uh, of property value. And just to give you an example, if you owned a property valued at $350,000, you would be paying the port $84 uh, annually as a, as a uh, household in the, in the port district. And just an information that the money that we collect through the tax levy is not available for us for salaries. We cannot use it for salaries, only payment of debt on outstanding loan, we can purchase assets or, or repair assets, and uh, we use it all can also use it for environmental cleanup. 
people are always curious about who we trade with. So I include this map that shows who some of our trade partners are. Because of our West Coast location, we have a lot of important trading partners in the Far East. And this is primarily where our, a lot of our grain goes. We have ships going out all the time to Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan with grain because they love, uh, they love Washington, Oregon, and Idaho wheat. And uh, so just a little shot there. Our top export, it, not surprisingly, I've mentioned it enough tonight, is grain. And uh, the Columbia River is number one, uh, the number one way our nation moves uh, grain. And um, this map kind of shows uh, in here, uh, our, sort of our nation's breadbasket. And all of these states funnel money down rivers and all the way out the Columbia and out the mouth of the uh, by Astoria. And, of all of that wheat that goes out, POV gets, um, I think, yeah, here it is, 12% of our nation's wheat flows right through the port of Vancouver. And we get most of our wheat by rail and 20% uh, of it by barge. And our grain terminal, United Grain Corp, has the largest storage capacity on the US West Coast. If you've ever seen those big grain silos at the Port of Vancouver, they're the tallest structures in Clark County and they hold a lot of uh, wheat, corn and soybeans. And I love this chart because it kind of shows uh, just the mighty Columbia River moving 60% of our nation's wheat right down the river. As far as our imports, again, these are 2020, but uh, we brought in fertilizer, which is not surprising. Most of the fertilizer that we get in goes to, right directly out to farms in Eastern Oregon and Washington. We do get in steel imports, big uh, hunks of uh, raw steel that is taken over to Everest Steel over in, in uh, Oregon, in Portland, in the Northgate area. It's melted down and uh, made into mainly rolled out into sheets of steel that are rolled up and then go to be made into refrigerators, freezers, car parts, whatever. We also get in jet fuel that goes to the uh, Oregon Air National Guard over at PDX. And of course, we import Subarus. We don't get every make and model of Subaru, but quite a few. I think um, the Forester, the Impreza, we get their little sports car. And we're very excited because this spring, uh, Subaru is gonna start shipping out their first all electric vehicles. So we're trying to get ready for that because we've had to put in some charging uh, infrastructure at the port to deal with those cars when they come in. And then we did a ton of wind energy in 2020. Uh, we had almost 3000 wind components come through the port. Oh, here's a picture too of that raw steel and what it looks like and a ship with uh, wind products on it. And then um, in 2020, we really had a record breaking year as far as the wind that came through. We got the longest wind blades to ever enter the West Coast. They were almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty. And we handled a ton of wind energy in 20, 2020. We're gonna handle a lot in 2021 as well. Uh, but um, I think I included this photo, which shows one of those wind blades going out. They, they move them, many of them go out at two and three in the morning so that they don't disturb traffic as much. This is the mill plane, fourth plane Y by the port. And as it's going out, these big ones usually travel down. Um, they'll travel down mill plane all the way to the Glen Jackson Bridge and go over the Glen Jackson Bridge and then get on Highway 84. And then they go to points east, either to wind farms, usually in Oregon, Washington. And we've been sending a lot up to Canada. And when they send these guys out, they send them three at a time. They allow half an hour between each blade and they send three at a time so that when they arrive at their destination, they can put a wind tower together because of course each wind tower has three blades so they want them in groups of three so they can uh, put that tower together and I wanted to show you these guys we talked a little bit about the supply chain issues this is actually a product that we've been getting at the port because of the supply chain problems 
Normally these aluminum products are put in containers and ship, but they can't find containers because they're all kind of sitting on docks. And so they started to just put these loosely in these bundles like this into a hold of a ship. And this is what we call break bulk. These are items that are not containerized. And that's what our port kind of specializes in is break bulk items like wind blades. You can't put those in a container. They have to be just out on their own. And so it's unusual to ship this aluminum as break bulk, but they did. And our port can handle that because we've got the cranes and capacity to take this on. So we've been getting in these, um, a whole bunch of these kind of aluminum ingots. And they're, they're kind of pretty looking when you see them out on the terminal. Just to mention quickly that we also have industrial operations at the port. We have 50 industrial tenants who call the port home and uh, they produce everything like you can see here. This is Northwest Pack. They, they're probably really busy right now doing apples and pears. They also do tomatoes, lots of tomatoes in the summertime and plums. We have, of course, uh, Great Western Malting that does brewing supplies for the brewing industry. We, um, we have uh, sun, Sunlight Supply and a company called Hawthorne that, that does gardening supplies. We um, have a pl plastic in injection molding company and also, um, let's see, I am losing their name now, but we have a company that does um, sand and gravel for uh, concrete work, just to name a few. And a little bit on, on our Terminal 1 development. And um, this was a, kind of our high level concept of what we're after at Terminal 1. Right now, if you go down there, you'll see the hotel is, is topped out and is finishing uh, some of its construction. This is gonna be an AC Marriott hotel. We're also heavily constructing right now this area in front, which is called Vancouver Landing. This is where the old amphitheater used to be. And our agreement with the hotel, the hotel views this as their front, sort of their front patio, their front living room. So the agreement with the port was they would go in if we would uh, fix up this sort of front area for their guests to use. And they're going to have a beautiful patio out here that will take in uh, the river. And this is the, the, we're not doing anything really with the dock down here. The little dock will stay. Um, and the big the big push for the port next is repair of this huge section of dock. Some of this dock in here is new and doesn't need repair, but this dock that's under the old Key and Red Lion is original to the site. It's over a hundred years old and falling apart. So we have to fix this dock before we can build a public marketplace on top. And so that's our next big uh, thing is to tear down the Red Lion and the Key and get this dock repaired. And behind it, you'll see some kind of conceptual buildings. This is where uh, Zoom Info just announced that they're going to go. So we're ex really excited about that because they're going to make this their new campus. They're currently downtown Vancouver, but they're going to move down here. And Zoom Info will occupy a lot of the commercial buildings that the port has intended um, to construct down here at Terminal 1. The Renaissance Trail will come right under the new interstate bridge and go right through our property. It'll go in the back here like this. You could also uh, just walk in front of the marketplace and then join up with the Renaissance Trail as well. But uh, that'll be nice addition. And let's see, these are some pictures I wanted to throw in for you guys because I just took a tour of the AC Marriott. So we went clear up to the top. This is their kind of one of their better rooms that they just you know, floor to ceiling windows that are just gonna take advantage of that river view. But this is a premier corner room that they're gonna have in that hotel. This is a look from sort of up on their roof, looking down on the old decrepit red lion, which the, the uh, Marriott is really hoping we can take down as soon as possible. They really hate that their guests are gonna have to look at that. But we have plans to take those buildings down beginning it, if not late December, then very early in January. And uh, we'll be taking all those buildings down. We hope in the old key area, which is down here, that we can use some of the, there should be old growth timbers in that building because 
that's the original ports warehouse and and it's still there the bones of that warehouse so we're hoping that there's some nice wood in there that we can reclaim and reuse in the public market here's another couple pictures this is that vancouver landing site under construction this is the old amphitheater that's gone now and will be a, a really just a beautiful area for people to sit outside. We can hold festivals here and little gatherings and music, and uh, you can enjoy the river. And again, the, sort of the front, uh, the front patio of that hotel. And this is just a view of the Renaissance Trail where it's gonna come through the property and meet up with what the city has already constructed down here. And this is Rick Takesh over here. He's the owner and developer of the Marriott Hotel and he, uh, gave us a tour recently and, and was this is the lobby and he was just describing these doors and that will be here that will take you out onto the this area the landing area and that nice patio out in front of the hotel and i think that's all i have for you guys tonight um this is one of our tour groups one one of these days we'll get back to be able uh, to do tours at the port again but um thank you i i appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit more tonight and if anybody has any questions, I'd, I'd love to take them. And let me get out of the screen sharing. Let's see. Here. Okay. Steve, that may have gone a little long. No, that's fine. Okay. Don't worry about it. I have it. a question. Sure. Does the port property include the railway station? No. No, that's owned. Uh, well, the station, of course, is an Amtrak station. So yeah, no, we don't own. Uh, we kind of stop there just below it. You'll see that not very attractive metal recycling right. area. That's Pacific Coast shredding. They don't look very nice, but they do important work because they send all that recycled metal overseas and it's recycled into new products. But it's not I understand very attractive. that. It just would have been perfect if we could have carried that all waterfront around to the station yeah oh that would be good that's a neat neat idea bridget because yeah it's kind of historic there it's pretty it's beautiful it's building yeah yeah it is <laughs> looks like cheryl had a question um you said that they had you have 17 bar pilots how many um of the river pilots do you have do you know yeah we have about 45 uh river pilots yeah, and about 17 or 18. And there was one woman for a while, a uh, bar pilot. Oh. And uh, yeah, I, I always tell people I'd like to do a psychological profile on, on, the, on the bar pilots because it, it's yes. like this most dangerous job on earth. And uh, I mean, I just can't even imagine uh, that job. Just so specialized. Exactly. I want to have like a question like Tugboat Annie in Seattle all those many years ago. Oh. Yeah. Real, okay. real, actual real person. Yeah. 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 Cool. This is lovely. Uh, I just sent you a little note. Uh, Julie, if you could share the slideshow with Mary Lee so that we could use some of this information in our newsletters. You bet. I, think I, I sent it to Mary Lee. Uh, yeah. I sent it as a PDF, so it should be oh, easy perfect. to yeah. Julie, can you describe uh, the um, the it's training the to be a, a a bar pilot or a, a river pilot? Yeah, they they're asked that a lot too because they would love to have uh, you know people in the pipeline who want to do that job. You start out really as a deckhand, and you learn all about ships. And um, some of them started out on tugboats as deckhands, and you work your way up to being you know kind of a ship captain. Uh, these guys are, are not dummies. I mean, I've seen some of the, the charts they have to work with and the math they have to do. In the summertime, when the river's low, there's sometimes a foot clearance between the bottom of the keel of the boat and the bottom of the river. And, you know, they are uh, navigating through both the river pilots and the bar pilots. Uh, they, ha they have a lot of training. I mean, most of the guys who end up being bar and river pilots are already in their 40s because they put in a lot of years already on the river or on water. And by the way, this is very interesting. I found out if you're a river pilot on the Columbia River, you can't work any other river in the world. 
The, right. They're very specialized, like you, that you could not move to Mississippi and immediately become a Mississippi River pilot. You'd have to go through training to do that and vice versa, because they're so specialized in their particular waterway. Yeah. Anything hmm. else? I think Bridget. I can't resist asking how close would a new I-5 bridge come to the port property yeah. that what eastern end of your property? Yeah, that's a really good question. And what we've done is we've, we've planned <coughs> everything with that new bridge in mind. And right next to the bridge, we have planned to have a water treatment facility. The closest building that will come to it is the public market. And there's a drip line you have to have from the bridge down. But the new, the new bridge is planned to be super high, like way higher than the current bridge because then we won't have to have any more bridge lifts. You know, one oh. sailboat that causes a bridge lift, one sailboat can stop commerce between Canada and Mexico. I mean, the bridge lifts are, are really a bad, bad deal. So the new bridge is planned to be much higher so we don't have to have bridge lifts anymore. Um, so that gives us some height there to work with, but um, we have used the original um, engineering documents from the first, where those footings go for the bridge is not going to change a whole lot because all of that engineering was done already with the past bridge effort that failed. So we kind of know where the footings are going to go for the bridge and we've planned our development accordingly, if that makes sense, Bridget. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. You guys should get a presentation about the bridge because I think they're. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Steve, I have a question. Uh, Judy. Yeah. Uh, Julie, if and when we get our meetings going again, our in person meetings, uh, are you uh, <clears throat> able to come to a meetings and give a presentation like this? Of course, I'd love to anytime. You just okay. tell me when you meet. I'd be glad to come. That would be very cool. This, a, I want to thank you for the, the great information. I just learned so much just in this little bit of time. Oh, good. Court. And I would oh. love to do a tour once they get going too. Yes, as soon as we get the tours back, we got to get your group on a tour. I think you would just enjoy it when you can see it firsthand. It's so much fun. And um, when I can come out to the meetings in person, I bring samples of stuff we can pass around, you know, so people can see what copper concentrate is and what the wheat looks like and all that. It makes it makes it a little more fun if you can touch it. So yeah, the black have dim sum. tours are really a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, good. my husband was impressed with the cookies. <laughs> oh, yeah. We feed everybody, too. Like yeah. We have yeah. lunch, lunch and stuff. Yeah. Well, we figure if you're going to give me that much of your time for a tour, we at least have to feed you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you to Julie, because yeah. I had a neighbor that posted a question on next door that I took to Julie and got a formal statement that I could put out and had directed him to, before I got Julie's statement, directed him to the Know Your Port, which is... Uh, like a tour, a, a, a virtual tour on there. And that was really cool. And I have gotten a lot of comments about that virtual tour. So oh, I, yeah. yeah, so got that out there. But also um, we're thinking of trying to get people from the neighborhood to sign up for a tour, get yes. you know, a true, yeah, get a neighborhood tour going. That so would be, that would be awesome. And uh, yeah, when, when and if we can get those tours back up, um, I put extra money in the budget each year for extra tours that we might need as well as just the public. I do 10 public tours, but they fill up really fast. But if I've got a special group that really wants to come, we can always get you a bus. So Good to know. Well, thanks for the opportunity, everybody. I always like talking about the port, so thank you. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. It was a treat. Okay, so.